The house that I live in is only a couple hundred meters away from a small church in a suburb. Although I was brought up a Christian, I was never truly religious, and I only went to said church whenever my parents took me as a kid. My dad died when I was a teenager, and we stopped going as a family altogether. After that, I only went whenever my friends asked me to tag along. Now I'm 21, and I only ever pass by the church whenever I have to go into the city because there's a dirt road beside it that leads to the parking lot behind, adjacent to a major road where it was easy to get on a bus to work. It was closer than the village gate in the opposite direction, and I only had to ride one bus from there. I'm not an easily scared man, nor have I previously experienced lasting trauma after being spooked, and I'm here to tell you that what I saw beside that church three months ago still haunts me to my core. A storm had been announced to hit earlier that week, but leaving for work early that Thursday morning, the skies were clear. Not a single cloud to cover the starry sky, so I didn't think to bring an umbrella. I climbed over the parking lot gate because it was chained shut until 6 for the first mass. While there's a guard employed by the church meant to be at an outpost nearby this fence, he often wasn't at his post so it made it easy for me to get to my shortcut. I work at a hotel as a line cook, and it can be a very demanding job. I have to leave home before the sunrise, and most days I work long after it is set. The only time I get to see the sun is if I'm assigned to a station at the buffet where we have a view of the poolside. It was an average, overworked and underpaid kind of day for me. I wasn't assigned at the buffet line, I stayed in the kitchen where there weren't any windows, so I was surprised to see the flooded streets once I clocked out. Apparently, it had been raining heavily all afternoon, and it subsided right around sunset. It was now around 8 in the evening when I left the hotel, and in my country, flooded streets meant standstill traffic for at least a couple of hours. This wasn't that uncommon. I had dealt with similar situations before. It also meant I could sleep on the bus, so it wasn't too upsetting. Fast forward to around midnight, and it's pouring again. I'm not too far off from the church parking lot, so I decided to get off the bus and start walking, because traffic had not budged for the last 10 minutes. I put my phone and wallet in my waterproof backpack, which also contained a spare shirt, my house key, and my set of knives. Around this time, the parking lot gate was already chained shut, but I climbed over, like I typically do. It was flooded knee-deep in the parking lot, and there was no security at the outpost. Big surprise. I figured that he had retreated into the church. It's dark, but I focus on the small lights from the houses off in the distance. They only look like dots from that far away. I trudge my way through the open parking lot that could have passed as a kiddie pool, when I hear this strange sloshing at the far corner to my left. Due to the heavy rain, I couldn't clearly make out what was there, but I knew that I wasn't alone. All the lights to the lot were off, and the only things to guide me were the few lights of the houses far ahead in my memory of the area's landscape. It's a straight shot from the dirt road, so I didn't really have to worry about a light source. The sound of all the falling raindrops accumulated into dull static noise, so it was easy for me to hear that there was something going on in that corner. I could see the shape of a person who seemed to be sitting down, so I could really only see them from the waist up. As I got closer, and my eyes better adjusted to the dark, I could tell that it was a woman because of the long hair and the outline of her body. She was flailing her arms and splashing the water around, grunting as she pounded her fists into the water. She was about two car lengths away, so I wasn't too concerned about it. I've dealt with crazy people before. I glanced over a few times as I passed her, and then got to the dirt road. Quite unnerving. She was out of my line of sight at this point, and the mud made it hard for me to walk. Water was only ankle deep, but I kept having to jerk my foot free after each step because my shoes would sink into the mud. A small splash made me look over my shoulder, and in the darkness of that dirt road, 
the woman was splayed out face first in the shallow water. I froze, thinking whether or not I should help her. I hated the thought of being the guy who let someone drown in water only six inches deep. She was about ten steps away from me, and before I could decide what to do, she started to move. It was too dark to see any details, but her outline was distinguishable enough, just enough for me to see that she was looking up at me. She slowly got on her hands and feet, like she was about to stand, but her hands lingered on the ground, rump in the air. I was already scared pale at this point. My legs didn't work, and I thought of reaching for my knives, but I was afraid to move. That's when she starts crawling toward me on her hands and feet. This sends a jolt through me, and all of a sudden, I'm sprinting toward my house. I could hear the splashes behind me along with her coarse breathing, almost as if she was coughing. My eyes started filling with tears, and the rain against my face made the light in the distant houses blurry, but I knew that at that point, I was running for my life. I couldn't tell if she was catching up, but I didn't have it in me to look back. I heard her yell in a voice so rough, it resembled a pig squeal. Short, sharp, and loud. A wordless shout, filled with anger. I believe that that was the fastest that I've ever run in my life. And at this point, I couldn't hear anything but the rain. Deafening, unrelenting, and violent. My house was close. I sped by a few other houses with their dim porch lights on and I could tell that I was running on asphalt. I didn't know when it happened, but apparently I lost my shoes back at the dirt road. One last bend, and I was back at my doorstep. I forcefully ripped my backpack zipper open and fumbled around the inside for the key, frantically looking around to see if this woman was still chasing me. I got in the house, slammed the door shut, and collapsed in a heap. I don't really recall the rest of the night, but... When I woke up the next morning in my bed, my older brother filled me in. He was awake when I got home that night and went to the front door when the noise alerted him. He said I was on my knees, leaning against the door and quietly sobbing. He woke my mom and they did their best to console me, but I wouldn't talk. They tried to ask me questions, but I just shake my head. They got me into some dry clothes and led me to my bed. Over breakfast that morning, I explained to the best of my abilities what had happened, and my mom said that she'd notify the village guards. I could tell that they were concerned for my safety, but they didn't understand the fear that I felt. My brother even joked about it. I didn't go to work that day. In fact, I took the rest of the week off due to the fact that I caught a fever. The guards did a minor investigation and even increased patrols for a while, but they didn't find anything. Nothing except for my shoes in the parking lot. When I got better, I started taking the long walk to the main village gate to work. When I head home, I now carpool with a buddy who can get me close enough to home that I don't have to use the dirt road route. Days that he can't drive me, I take a taxi, even if it hurts my pocket a bit. I can't walk alone anymore, not without glancing over my shoulder every five seconds. Sudden loud noises make my heart jump, and I can't quite stand the sound of rain. I've been getting better, though. I can sleep with the lights off now. I just wish I would stop seeing that crawling woman's shape whenever I start drifting off to sleep. I wish I could tell you more about her. I honestly do. Because it's one thing to be afraid of something, but when you lack the understanding of what it is you fear, your mind fills in all the blanks with absolutely terrifying detail. On a rainy night in the era before cell phones, I was 18, walking a very long way home from work, and I foolishly accepted a ride home from a strange man. Small town girl, living in her lonely world, and I had just gotten off of a double shift. He was elderly, acted genuinely concerned for me, and I saw a Bible in the back seat of his car. Probably safe, right? The car was old, beaten up, 
and he had to get out of the car to open the passenger side door for me. It took him a while, as he had trouble walking with a bum leg. He told me that the passenger door didn't open from the inside. I immediately felt weird at this admission, but years of nice girl training told me, he's gone to so much trouble, don't say no. We chatted for a while, and he politely complimented me on my uniform, my hair, and told me that I looked like his late wife, and that her spirit must have led him to help me get home. It sounded kind of sweet the way that he told it. The conversation turned to if I was still in school, what my hobbies were like, and gradually turned to whether or not I was on my period, which I found rude, but he acted like it was going to be the punchline of a joke. So I laughingly asked him why he would want to know. He said, very calmly, because if you're fertile, we should start trying for a family right away. Oh, sh**. He said that God had kept him lonely for years, but now, because I looked so much like his late wife, it was clear I was meant to be his, so we could start life over again and finally have lots of children like his wife was unable to do. He grabbed my hand and kissed it, and said, I can't wait to show you our new bed. The last few minutes with this man confirmed to me that this geezer was out of his mind. I told him I forgot something at work. He told me that I could get it tomorrow. I told him that I needed to pee, and he said that I could hold it until we got home. He wasn't going to let me out. He kept talking about how things were different back then, and how men are the head of the household, and that women are to follow their fathers, and then their husbands, and God says this, and God says that. He talked about his wedding day, how his wife's father had given her to him. So I blurted out, you're going to get my father's permission to marry me before taking me to your home, right? God would want that. You need to do that because otherwise we would be living in sin, and the marriage bed is not holy, which I remembered from my many, many days of church sermons. He got offended by this, and said that he knew the Bible better than I did, and of course he knew to ask my father for permission. I told him that we couldn't live together in sin, and we should just go to my house before going home. I then reminded him that the street wasn't far off, still trying to keep the conversation light and joking, I told him that's what a godly man would do, and he wholeheartedly agreed. We then got to the street where I had previously told him that I lived. He asked which house was my parents. I gave him a fake house number, far away from mine, and had him drop me there. He wanted to come inside, but I told him that I needed to let my parents know about God sending me a husband before he could meet them. I said it would take a few days. Come back tomorrow. He replied with, I'll give you a few minutes, but then we need to be on our way. I told him to drive around the block so I could have some time to pack my clothes. He nodded and finally opened the car door. I ran up to that random house's door, waved at him until he drove off, then sprinted off through the rain to my house, where I lived alone. I double bolted my door and put my couch in front of it that night. Never saw that guy again. I didn't call the police, though now I wish that I had. I moved in with my boyfriend a few days later and I insisted on waiting at work until he could pick me up every night after. No more long walks in the dark for me. This story took place last November, it was cold, rainy, and around midnight. My fiancé and I like taking spontaneous late night drives. We typically start out on one of the main roads within our city and keep following it until we hit the next town. Sometimes our drives last hours. The layout of my county and surrounding counties is a little bizarre. All of the cities and towns are isolated by large spreads of woods and country. I live in a relatively large college town, but a half hour drive in one direction 
can land you stranded on jagged unmarked gravel roads in the middle of nowhere, or in small weird villages that no one really knows about. It's actually kind of exciting, and that's why we do it so much. So it's midnight, and we're nearly lost. Willa, my fiance, is poking around on my phone trying to figure out what road we're on. We're on a mud path in a pit of country framed by small towns that we've never heard of. Flory, Wenica, and Tell, or something along those lines. There are no other cars on the road. It's rainy, foggy, and the headlights on my car aren't doing a damn thing. There are strands of trees and brush on either side of the road. We know that we're heading north. Willa tells me that she thinks we're going to cross W Street, which runs into Rye Road, which is a straight shot to Wenica. We make our way down the mud road for a half hour, but never hit it. We've always had fun on these sorts of drives. This is the first time that we've ever really been on edge. Willa says that we should have found W Street already, and asks if we passed it without noticing. I ask her nervously in response if she thinks we should turn around, but she doesn't think we can without backing up into a tree or an unseen ditch. She's biting her nails while scrolling around on Google Maps. Ten minutes pass, and we finally see a little black road snaking up a hill, branching off of the road that we're on. I hurriedly turn onto it. It's very narrow and twigs and branches are raking the doors and windows of the car. When we complete the climb up the little road, we find ourselves in a wide paved clearing with a house at the back of it, tucked up into the thick woods. Willa doesn't miss a beat before she starts hissing for me to turn around. Our headlights illuminate the whole property, which is in major disrepair. No lights, shattered windows, Siding and shingles absolutely shredded. The yard is littered with scraps and trash. Barrels, car parts, tools, hundreds of glass bottles, slabs of concrete, rocks, and a nasty old Chevy pickup. It looks like the house is sitting on top of all of it. Every inch of the property is entangled in nets of ivy and weeds. Willa points out little moving shadows and glowing spots around the yard. It takes me a moment to realize that the glowing spots are cat's eyes. There are dozens of cats around and they're all looking at us, their eyes glimmering in the headlights. I almost piss myself when a walnut-sized rock darts out of the brush and pops up against the windshield. Upon impact, it fractures the glass. Willis screams and grabs my arm. She's whimpering. Denny, what was that? Oh my god, what was that, Den? What happened? The rain is pouring in black streams down the trees, over the house, and across the pavement. All of the blood drains from my face. When, after a few seconds, a man stumbles out from the bushes, and he's carrying a fucking shovel. He's swallowed in a big, dirty navy coat, and has a long, unkempt beard. Then, a screen door on the house flies open, and all the cats scatter. A tall, thin, spidery woman ambles out onto the porch. She has long, wild gray hair, and she's just up high enough on the porch that the headlights don't reach her eyes. She wipes her unusually dark hands on her skirt. I have no idea what was on her hands, but that's what I remember most about her. How dark her hands were. She's locked in staring at us. Willa is screaming, crying, and slapping the door lock repeatedly. I throw the car into reverse, rolling over cinder blocks and branches, and then screech back down the road. After Willa stops crying and there's some distance between us and the house, I start to relax. Yet, when we get out of the woods and hit a long stretch of straight road, I notice headlights behind us. I get a stomach ache when I notice that the car is mimicking all of our turns onto different roads. After nearly half an hour of being pursued, we finally reach Flory, 
and pull into a gas station being visited by a few other people. I watch the vehicle pass. It's the same nasty Chevy truck that we saw at the house. They stalked us all the way to the next town. We wait till we see the truck disappear down the road before we get out, grab some food, and ask for directions. On our way home, I look at the rearview mirror more than I do the road ahead. And when we arrive back at home early in the morning, my teeth don't stop chattering until I fall asleep. While this was a wild occurrence, thankfully, we still have night road trips and run into really weird and cool things. We haven't encountered anything to top that creep sesh, though. Since telling our families about it, we've been told to be a little more careful about where we go. We've also stored a knife in the glove box. I also keep my rosary in the car for now. In case, you know, I'm dying and need to say a couple last Hail Marys. I've driven back around that area during the daytime recently. I even managed to find the mud road we were on. Country Road 90N. But I wasn't able to find the turnoff to get to that particular residence. I did get my windshield fixed. And Willa has since suggested that we have locations in mind when we go out on our night drives. That way, we're not driving around aimlessly. I have a few parting words of safety for anyone else out there that goes on night drives like we do. Stick to main roads, unless you know that area well. If the weather is bad, avoid country roads. They can be swept away by flash floods, get icy, or can be blocked by snow. If you're driving at night, avoid leaving your vehicle unless you're in a well-lit location. Always keep your doors locked, even while on the move. In the country, it's common to run into people who don't have the best intentions. Trust your instincts. If someone is giving you bad vibes, get away. Don't roll down your window for anyone. And that extends to not stopping for anyone either. If anything should happen, your car breaks down, flat tire, wreck, while you're on a country road, call the police and don't get out of your car until they arrive. My sister got a flat on a country road and was approached by a whole lot of creepy guys. Don't worry about offending people. Just wait for the police and maintain your safety. Always have a spare tire, a full tank of gas, and a fully charged phone if you know you're going to be driving a lot, especially in weird places. Finally, don't honk excessively or be rude or an aggressive driver. People have gotten shot for much less driving around the country.